Then they looking for trouble. Ran right up in the knowledge. Now they back in the huddle. Now they know we can fight. Content given every week. Me and Dr. Rip Shot. Keep on bringing the heat. Now they know that we hit. And they know we ain't quitting. Yo, she mind the jigging. Keep on bringing the giving. Unity, unity, unity. What up, though? What up, though? How's everybody doing? Hi, Felicia Brown. Hi, Cheryl Lynn. Wendy Julian. What up, though? And LaDonna Bell. Thank you guys for showing up. Today, I got an, uh, today I got a show. I hope that everybody will enjoy. And uh, the show is uh, very interesting to me, and I think that you'll love it. And the reason I know you're going to love it is that we're talking about ancient Egypt. You know, but uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Yoshi Ma for, for uh, creating my uh, theme song. I mean, uh, <laughs> how many other brothers got a theme song? Yaza, yaza, yaza. That was made by Yoshi Ma, the genius. Yoshi Ma is truly a genius. You guys got to go to his website, family. You got to support his, uh, his videos. You know, he's also an artist. He's an artist. He's an illustrator. He's an... Uh, He's, he's a musician. He's a producer. I mean, this man is just bad. Duh. Support Yoshi Ma. Let him know that. Show him some love. But anyway, today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, ancient Egypt. You know, a lot of us have made a big mistake. And this big mistake, it comes from the fact that a lot of, uh, a lot of black people, a lot of black people have failed to understand that, uh, that, that everything about European history, African history, Egyptian history has not been done. It's not been done, you see? What you have to remember is this. What you have to remember in a sense is that people want to sell you a lie. 
the Europeans would pretend that everything is done, everything that you need to know has been done. But I'm going to talk to you about the Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. You know, a lot of people call that a myth. And they say, it, as they say it's a myth because of the fact that uh, the Smithsonian Institution claims that, uh, that, that they don't have any artifacts. Allegedly, uh, there's this newspaper article, and it discussed the fact that these scientists found a whole lot of artifacts. Yes, artifacts that relate to ancient Egypt. But the Smithsonian Institution, where they sent the artifacts, they claim in a sense that there's no artifacts there. But, but we know this is all like, what up, Melvin Reed? Uh, thank you very much. This is my mind, mind. This man is the heaviest the deepest, the uh, bravest brother I know. He's always here. But again, uh, you know, Europeans, what they had to do is this. Because of the fact they held us as slaves for about, what, three, 400 years. And because of the fact that the Aboriginal, Aboriginal Americans were Black, that the Smithsonian Institution had to claim that Black people, in a sense, had nothing to do with over here. And if they said that the Egyptians, who they knew in terms of the artifacts, in terms of whatever they found in that thing would have been black, that would have upset the status quo. And the European, yes, the European, the American has always had to lie. And he has to lie because it's through his lies that he's able in a sense to project falsehood. But we're gonna, uh, we're gonna uh, talk about uh, blacks in the Grand Canyon, the Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. So uh, let's, get, uh, let's get started. Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. Yes, they were Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. I'd like you to go to my Pantheon, my Patreon to see the slides. And now uh, you can go to, uh, you're right here, you're on uh, Clyde Winner's YouTube video. Make sure, make sure that you, that you subscribe and that you like this video. That helps other people to get to the site. You know, I, I really wish that I could get up to maybe 100,000, but that's impossible. Because the fact in a sense that they take away a lot of uh, the, my subscribers. But I do want you to subscribe to this website. I do want you, in a sense, to click the bell so that you can get notifications. And I thank you for coming here today. And I'd also like you to uh, go to my Patreon. Join my Patreon. I need your help because this research that I'm going to talk about now is not free, you know? I have to pay for articles. I have to pay for books. You know, I just got a new book today that I that I uh, bought that, that deals with Egypt and, and the uh, Red Beta. But again... There's so much knowledge out there. Join me on Patreon. FBA is not a group. FBA is not an organization. FBA is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry or pedigree. As a result, we are descendants of the African and Aboriginal Blacks who built the United States. Yes, yes, yes. That's why they lie about our history. That's why they won't tell you about the Black people that live here, the Black people in the sense that created a great civilization here. Egyptians in the Grand Canyon, yes. The Grand Canyon has what's called a forbidden zone. Many features in the Grand Canyon have Egyptian names like Tower of Set, Tower of Rock, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, Isis Temple, Cheops Pyramid, and Buddha Cluster, Buddha Temple, Manu Temple, and Shiva Temple. You can see some of these, uh, you can see some of these sites, but you know, it's interesting that although they have names of these various uh, uh, places in the Grand Canyon, <laughs> they say that these names mean nothing. These names have nothing to do with uh, with, with maybe the Egyptians or, or in a sense, the uh, people of ancient India. But again, why would they? Why would they do this? And 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 why would they call a place Shiva Temple or or Osiris Temple or Isis Temple and then have the uh, the same cave uh, uh, boarded up? You know, with steel, you know, uh, rods so that you can't get through you can't get through. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because they're hiding something from us. They're hiding something from us that if you found out, if we found out, we'd have to say, hey, you're liars. There's controversy concerning the story that an explorer discovered Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon. The story goes that an explorer, G. Kincaid, took a boat down the Colorado River into the Grand Canyon. After going about 40 miles upriver, from the El Tabar Crystal Canyon, Kincaid recognized the strange sediment formation 
about 2,000 feet up the side of the canyon. This led to a great article called Explorations in Grand Canyon. Kincaid's discovery was reported in a local newspaper in 1906. Uh, there was uh, two articles about it, and these uh, two articles related this story about this Egyptian cave, this Egyptian monument that the Smithsonian says doesn't exist. Kincaid claims he found a trail which led to a stairway. Walking up the carved sandstone stairs, he found a cave entrance that led to his discovery of a cavern. After turning on his flashlight, he was surprised to find artifacts which he imagined were of Egyptian origin. Jack Andrews in a 2001 article claimed that the cave described in the headline story of Arizona Gazette, April 5th, 1909, and this fantastic underground installation was, and still may be, located above an approximate six mile stretch of the Colorado River in Marble Canyon. At the border of Marble Canyon in the Navajo Nation, above an area near, near Quangut Rapids. You know, interesting, so let's, let's see what Jack Andrews was talking about. Today, the story is considered a hoax by many researchers because the Smithsonian Institution claims no Egyptian artifacts are in the museum from this alleged Egyptian Grand Canyon tomb. C. E. Kincaid report. C. E. Kincaid believed himself to be the first white person born in Idaho. He was an explorer and hunter all his life, working 30 years for the Smithsonian Institute. Below are excerpts from his journal of his alleged adventure in the cave. I quote, I was journeying down the Colorado River in a boat alone, looking for minerals. Some 42 miles up the river from the El Tabar Crystal Canyon, I noticed on the east wall stains in the sedimentary formation about 2,000 feet above the riverbed. There was no trail to this point, but I finally reached it with a great difficulty. This cliff face is purported to be the location of the cave entrance to the mysterious underground citadel. The entrance is 1,486 feet down the sheer canyon wall. Above a shelf which hid it from view from the river was the mouth of the cave. There are steps leading from this entrance some 30 yards to what was at the time the level of the river. When I saw the chisel marks on the wall inside the entrance, I became interested. Securing my gun, I went in. I gathered a number of relics which I carried down to Colorado to Yuma, from whence I shipped them to Washington with details of the discovery. Following this, other explorations were undertaken. So interested have the scientists become that preparations are being made to equip our camp for extensive studies, the number of archeologists increasing to from 30 to 40. From the long main passage, another mammoth chamber has been discovered from which radiate scores of passageways like the spokes of a wheel. This is a kind of a description, and uh, this isn't a Kincaid's um, description, but what it is is that it's an artist's rendition of, 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 of the details of the story that I'm relating to you right now. I'll continue. Several hundred rooms have been discovered, reached by passageways running from the main passage, one of them having been explored for 854 feet and another 634 feet. The recent finds include articles which have never been known as native to this country, and doubtless they had their origin in the Orient. War weapons, copper instruments, sharp edged and hard as steel indicate the high state of civilization reached by these people. The main passageway is about 12 feet wide, narrowing to nine feet toward the farther end, about 57 feet from the entrance, the first of the side passages branch off to the right and left, along which on both sides are a number of rooms about the size of ordinary living rooms of today. Though some are 30 by 40 feet square, these are entered by oval shaped doors and are ventilated by, by round air spaces through the walls into the passage. The walls are about three feet, six inches thick. The passages are chiseled or hewn, as straight as could be laid out by an engineer. The ceilings of many other rooms converge to a center. The side passages near the entrance run at a sharp angle from the main hall, but toward the rear, they gradually reach a right angle in direction. 
over 100 feet from the entrance is the cross wall, several hundred feet long, in which I found the idol or image of the people's God sitting cross-laid with a lotus flower or lily in each hand. Ah, look on the uh, right-hand side. This is an artist's, you know, uh, uh, imagine uh, rendering of what uh, Mr. Kincaid found. The cast of the face is oriental. The idol almost resembles Buddha, though the scientists are not certain as to what religious worship it represents. Taken into consideration everything found thus far, it is possible that this worship must resemble the ancient people of Tibet. Buddha, Buddha, Buddha! Surrounding this idol are smaller images, some very beautiful in form, others crooked, neck, and distorted shapes, symbolical probably of good and evil. There are two large cactus with protruding arms, one on each side of the dais on which the god squats. All of this is carved out of hard rock resembling marble. In the opposite corner of this cross hall were found tools of all descriptions made of copper. These people undoubtedly knew the lost art of hardening this metal, which has been sought by chemicals for centuries without result. On a bench running around the workroom was some charcoal and other material probably used in the process. There's also slag and stuff similar to mine, showing that these ancient smelted ores, but so far no trace of where or how this was done has been discovered, nor the origin of the ore. You know, this was in the uh, 1890s. Uh, this is an aside. What they found is they found, they found hundreds of copper mines. Many of these uh, copper mines have been found in the Midwest, but they found hundreds of copper mines. They found in the sense that, that copper had been mined by our Aboriginal ancestors for thousands of years before the European got here. But let's get back to a Kincaid story. Among the other findings are vases of urns and cups of copper and gold, very artistic in design. The pottery work includes enameled ware and glazed vessels. Another passageway leads to, to granaries, such as are found in the Oriental temples. They contain seeds of various kinds. One very large storehouse has not yet been entered as it is 12 feet high and can be reached only from above. Two copper hooks extend on the edge, which indicates that some sort of ladder was attached. These granaries are rounded, as the materials of which they are constructed, I think, is a very hard cement. A gray metal was also found in this cavern, which puzzles the scientists for its identity has not been established. It resembles platinum, strewn promiscuously over the floor. Everywhere are what people call Cat's eyes, a yellow stone of no great value. Each one is engraved with the head of the Mali type. Hmm. Carved on all the urns over doorways and tablets of stone are mysterious hieroglyphs, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes to discover. The engravings on the tablets probably has something to do with the region of the people. Similar hieroglyphs have been found in southern Arizona. Among the pictorial writing, only two animals are found one of them looking for his door. The tomb or crypt in which the mummies were found is one of the largest of the chambers, the walls slanting back at an angle of about 35 degrees. On these are tiers of mummies, each one occupying a separate hewn shelf. At the head of each is a small bench on which is found copper cups and pieces of broken swords. Some of the mummies are covered with clay and all are wrapped in a bark fabric. Another, again, this is an artist's rendition of what uh what uh Jen, you know Kincaid probably saw when he entered that cave. The urns of cups of the lower tiers are crude, while as the higher shelves are reached, the urns are finer in design, showing the latter stage of civilization. It is worthy of note that all the mummies examined so far have proved to be male, no children or females being buried here. This leads to the belief that this interior section was the warrior's barracks. Among the discoveries, no bones of animals have been found, no skins, no clothing, no bedding. Many of the rooms are bare but for water vessels. One room about 40 by 700 feet was probably the main dining hall, but cooking utensils are found here. What these people lived on is a problem, though it is presumed that they came south in the winter and farmed in the valleys going back north in the summer. Again, this is a very interesting uh, uh, situation. And, and, and uh, we, we have to assume that, that these Egyptians, when they came here, they may have came as warriors or, or as adventurers, you know what I mean? 
get that idea out of your mind that black people have always just just remained in Africa and black people have never wanted to explore. Yes, black people like adventure too. Black people wanted to know more about the world too. And that, that these men were probably explorers that came to the, you know, the Grand Canyon. Upwards of 50,000 people could have lived in the caverns comfortably. One theory is that the present Indian tribes found in Arizona are descendants of the serfs or slaves of the people who inhabited the cave. Undoubtedly, a good many thousand years before the Christian era, a people lived here, which reached the highest stage of civilization. The chronology of human history is full of gaps. One thing I have not spoken of may be of interest. There's one chamber of the passageway which is not ventilated, and when we approached it, a deadly, snaky smell struck us. A light would not penetrate the room, and until stronger ones are available, we will not know what the chamber contains. Some say snakes, but others think it may contain a deadly gas or chemical used by the ancients. No sounds are heard, but it smells snaky, just the same. The whole underground installation gives one of shaky nerves that creeps. The gloomy feeling is like a weight on one's shoulder, and our flashlights and candles only make the darkness blacker. Imagination can reveal and conjecture and ungodly daydreams back through the ages that have elapsed till the mind reels dizzily in space. In connection with this story, it is notable that among the Hopi Indians, the tradition is told that their ancestors once lived in an underground underworld in the Grand Canyon, till dimensions dissension arose between the good and the bad, the people of one heart and the people of two hearts. Marchetto, who was their chief, counseled them to leave their underground cave. They sent out a message to the Temple of the Sun, asking the blessings, the blessings of peace, goodwill, and rain for people of one heart. That messenger never returned, but the day at the Hopi villages at sundown can be seen the old men of the tribe out on the housetops gazing toward the sun. Among the engravings of animals in the cave is seen the image of a heart over the spot where it is located. The legend was learned by W. E. Rowlands, the artist, during the years spent in the Hopi Indian. There are two theories of the origin of the Egyptians. One is that they came from Asia, another that the racial crater was in the Upper Nile region. Here, an Egyptologist believed in the Indian origin of the Egyptians. The discoveries in the Grand Canyon made throw further light on human evolution in prehistoric ages. Yes, yes, yes. This knowledge is important. This, just, just think if we could get into that basement of the Smithsonian Institution where they've had. Here's so much of our history. Just think what we could find. The Smithsonian Institute claims that no Egyptian artifacts of any kind have been found in North or South America. Moreover, the Smithsonian denies that there's any evidence of artifacts scattered. In the book, Suppressed Inventions by Jonathan Eisen, a spokesperson for the Smithsonian Institution denies any ancient Egyptian artifacts were found in the Grand Canyon. Well, the first thing I can tell you before we go any further is that no Egyptian artifacts of any kind have, been, have ever been found in the North or South America. This is what the Smithsonian wants us to believe. But let's think about this. Think about this. They said that these Egyptians, they, they saw Egyptian artifacts and they said that mummies were there. They said in the sense that Buddha was there. Then automatically you would say, damn, they must be lying. The Egyptians had nothing to do with Buddhism. You're wrong. You're wrong. That is the key to show that these were actual Egyptians because Buddhism was worshipped. Not worshipped because Buddhism is a religion, but Buddhism was practiced as philosophical thinking, and it was practiced in Africa around the time that these that these Egyptians could have sailed to America. This is a this is the uh, this is the in a sense the gun. This is a missing element that can prove that Egyptians were in the Grand Canyon, and that the fact that they worship Buddha had nothing to do with with India, had nothing to do with Asia, nothing to do with Tibet. It had all to do with the fact that Africans worship or practice Buddhism. Anti Jia in the African origin civilization said that, and I quote. It would seem that Buddha was an Egyptian priest chased from Memphis by the persecution of Cambyses. This tradition would justify the betrayal of Buddha with woolly hair. Historical documents do not invalidate this tradition. 
There's general agreement today on placing in the, in the sixth century, not only Buddha, but the whole religious and philosophical movement in Asia with Confucius in China, Zoroaster in Iran. This would confirm the hypothesis of a dispersion of Egyptian priests at the same time spreading their doctrine in Asia. Yes, 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 Diab was right. You know, at first, when, when I read this years ago, back at, back in the 1970s, I said, damn, what is he talking about? How could Buddhism be in Africa? But my research, my primary research proved that Diab was right. Flanders Petrie claimed that Buddhism dated back to the Persian period of Egypt, circa 525 to 405 BC. He wrote, and I quote, on the right side of the top is a Tibetan Mongolian. Below that, the Aryan woman of Punjab, and at the base, a seated figure in Indian attitude with the scarf over the left shoulder. These are the first remains of Indians known on the Mediterranean. Here, there too, there have been no material evidences for the connection, which is stated to have existed both by embassies from Egypt and Syria to India, and by the great Buddhist mission sent by Ashoka as far west as Greece and Cyrene. We seem now to have touched the Indian colony in Memphis, and we may hope for more light on that connection, which seems to have been so momentous for Western thought. Yes, yes, yes. Petri couldn't share more light on this, but I did. Yes, yes. I've looked into this. And see, this is very important. If Buddhism would, would, was in Egypt, then that would explain why there was a Buddha statue inside of that cave in the Grand Canyon. Buddhism in ancient Egypt, remember, oh, is, is well known, you see. If Petri's date is correct, this puts Buddhism in Egypt 200 years before Ashoka sent Buddhist missionaries to Egypt. This time period indicates that Buddhism was popular in Egypt during the Sioux Empire. Yes, yes, yes. If you want to find out more about Buddhism in Africa, in Egypt, ancient Egypt, Kemet, and uh, Mero, of the Kushite Empire, get my book, you see? Yes, 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 yes. Get my book on Buddhism, the Buddhist, Buddhism in Mero in Egypt. Get my book on Buddhism, you can learn more about it. Spanish, Spanish explorers claim that Mandy speaking people live near the four corner regions of, of the American Southwest. Let me, let me give you some more, some more details, some more information. This is interesting because the distance from Four Corners to Grand Canyon National Park is only 232 miles. The Manu were part of the Sioux Empire. Yes, yes, the Sioux Empire. Many people don't know about the Sioux Empire. I just published a book on the history of the Sioux Empire. It's a hidden empire. It's an empire that existed in the middle of Egypt. And in fact, one of the, the earliest kings, the earliest emperor of the Sioux Empire was Get this, an Egyptian pharaoh of the 14th dynasty. The Mandi were part of the Sioux Empire. The capital of the Sioux Empire was situated in the Nile Valley. Around the time of the Sioux Empire, Egyptians were practicing Buddhism. It's important to remember that Buddhism was a philosophy. Moreover, when they are chanting the word Om, Om, at the end we hear what? We hear Emma. Emma, we hear, we hear in a sense the hidden God of the Egyptians. And so, so, so when, 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 when Buddhists are medica meditating, when they're acting in a sense to gain enlightenment, who are they calling? They're calling on who? Um, um, Emma. This suggests that Buddhism, Buddhists are calling on the God Emma, Emma to grant their prayers. Kemet, the name of ancient Egypt, was not the only African civilization. 4,000 years ago, there was another great civilization in the Nile Valley in Africa. And this civilization was called Su. Although the capital of the empire was centered in the Nile Valley, Su extended into Asia. In history of the Su Empire, I tell you the history of the Su Empire and the Mandi speaking people who founded this gigantic empire that, 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 that stretched all the way from the Nile Valley to China, yes, to China. An early king of Su was Sheshi. Sheshi ruled for 19 years. It appears that his authority extended to the Hyksos, 
Kushites in Lower Egypt. She and she was married to a Nubian named Tadi. Their son was Nahisi. After Shinshe's death, the throne was given over to Pharaoh Nahisi Aser Sehri. The, theor the theocratic centers of Su were Philae and Ombo. The texts of Nahisi have been found at Nupti Gaski, Okasi, Mendes, and Sais of Su. The capital of Su was Ombo. Yes, yes. Here's, a, here's an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a sphinx of uh, King Nahisi. Pharaoh Nehisi. Yes, yes. This man was the emperor of the Sioux Empire, which extended all the way to China. Here's another, uh, here's another picture of Ambo Okashi. The Sioux people worshiped a number of gods, including Set, Nep, Nith, and Benib Diet. Benib Diet was a unifying god for the Sioux because the god was the spirit of Geb, Osiris. Rera and Shu. The major center of Bened Diet worship was Mendes. Philae was the symbolic seat of the Kushite high god. The most famous king of the second Sioux Empire was Nehisi. King Nehisi was the son of Sheshi, as I said earlier. Nehisi was a 14th dynasty king of Egypt. Nehisi. The throne names of Nehisi was Ah Ah Sheri. Stellas of Nehisi have been found in Tel El Mirdan, Tel Abua, Tel El Dab Ahna, Tajaru. Nehisi made many offerings to Bened Died. Nehisi was loved by people from Kush to Canaan, all the way to, uh, in a sense, uh, the ancient civilization of the Shias. Dr. Srinivasan makes it clear that Nehisi was a Sioux. Srinivasan made clear Nehisi was called Nahusha in Indian texts. Yes, yes, yes. When we talk about the Canaanites, when you're talking about, in a sense, the, the, the uh, you know, the various uh, Phoenicians, these people, in a sense, were related. They all, in a sense, it came from Africa and expanded outward. But it's a lie that Europeans developed or originated in Africa. No Europeans originated in Africa. No, 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 no. Europeans come from Central Asia. Only African people, black people, originated in Africa. The leaders of the Sioux Empire were predominantly Mandi speaking people. Their name Sioux comes from the Mandi word Si, which meant black people and nation. Thus, the addition of, a, of, a, of the plural U to Sioux to make it plural gives us the word Sioux. They were centered at Ombo, Okasi. The ancient Egyptians may have taken the Mississippi River into the Arkansas River and thence Colorado River to the Grand Canyon. Yes, yes, yes. On the right hand, on the right hand side, you can see the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River, you can enter it, you know, down in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And this river will take you all the way to Cal all the way to in a sense, Colorado. Once you get to Colorado, you can get on the Colorado River and you can sail into the Grand Canyon. This is probably how those Egyptians got there. This is how the Egyptians, those early blacks that lived in America, they got, in a sense, to the Grand Canyon. You see? Gymnosophists, they spread Buddhism in the Nile Valley. Flavius Philostratus, the writer of Vita Apolloni, Volume 1, claimed that the Gymnosophists in Moreau originally came from India. The fact that the Kushana had formerly ruled India around the time that the Merodic writing was introduced to the Kushite civilization led to the hypothesis that the ancestors of the Gymnosophists may have been Kushana philosophers. The Kushana, the historical evidence of the Kushana having ruled India, made the classical references to Indians, the Gymnosophists, and Mero an important source for the construction of alternative theories about the possible location of the cognate language. Yes, yes, Merodic! See? But even more so now we know because of the research of Lenny Shurimanasan, we know in a sense that, that that Buddha even lived. Yeah, Buddha lived in Nubia. This is what the research shows. Buddha lived in Nubia. So is it any wonder that when those Egyptians, when they sailed down the Mississippi River, then sailed along the Colorado River until they got to the Grand Canyon, which was probably much more fertile, much more habitable thousands of years ago. The 
that they took Buddhism with them. See, many marauders were Buddhists. Okay, here we can see, look over there at the, at the top left-hand side. We can see uh, Akinadad, a god of the marauders. Look at him. He looks like the Egyptian gods with four hands, four arms, and three legs. Then look, in a sense, at, at, at one of the monuments of the marauders. Look at the fact, in a sense, that on the bottom left-hand side, we can see, in a sense, a lotus blossom. And this lotus, and out of this lotus blossom comes what? In a sense, I can die. And finally, let's look at this statue, this middle picture. Here we see, in a sense, a Merodi, a Merodi, in a sense. And on her her funeral stella, look at that on her on her on her skirt. She has the Egyptian sign of holiness. What the Germans call the swastika, the swastika. Those are all Buddhist elements. Yes, yes, those Egyptians who came to the Grand Canyon knew about Buddhism. So was it any wonder that they had a statue of Buddha? You see? Considerable evidence of Buddhism in ancient Meroa Kush is in the form of Merodic iconography and the Merodic script. Much of the Buddha's influence surrounds Merodic god Apodemic. Apodemic was the lion god of the Merodis, worshipped by many. At the Temple of Naka, we see a number of examples of Buddhist influence, e.g. Apodemic, Apodem Apodemac, depicted as a three-headed lion, god with four arms. Also at the temple, Apodemac is represented as a snake coming out of a blossoming lotus with a lion head. These are all symbols of Buddhism! If the Marodis and the Egyptians were already showing signs of Buddhism, Buddhism philosophical existence, is it any wonder that those that those Egyptians in the Grand Canyon also show their leanings toward Buddhism? No, no. Here we can see, you know, epidemic depicted as a snake coming out of a lotus with a lion head. Let's take a look at that. The lotus, the snake, and also goes back to Buddhism. Epidemic depicted as a three-headed lion and guy with four arms. Look at this picture. That's epidemic in the middle. Look at that. Look at that. Why would the Merodes, why would the Merodes have their God depicted as in a way that, that gods were depicted by the Buddhists? And let's say worship Buddhism. Merodic temples dedicated to Epidemic have been found in Merod, Masuad, Sufra, and Naka. At the Temple of Naka, we see a number of examples of Buddhism influence. Here, Epidemic was depicted as a three-headed lion, God with four arms, and as a snake coming out of the lotus with a lion head. Remember, he looked at that. In India, the Gymnosophists used Tocharian and the Karasti script to write their scriptures. This makes it clear that Tocharian and Karasti were important means of communication for Merodic populations. Tocharian was therefore probably a major language in the Merodic Sudan. Let's take a look at this. Look over here and at the top, at the top right hand corner, we can see in a sense a comparison of the Merodic signs and the Karashti signs used by the Buddhists. Look, look how, look how this, look at this similarity. This explains in a sense why we find that 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 it's this new idea, this new writing system that was used by the Kushites in Moreau, used by the Kushites, that it related back to what? Their leanings toward Buddhism. Don't get it twisted. There was no isolation of Africans from other black people. It is a lie when they want you to believe that black people have always been isolated, that black people in a sense only, only, only lived in Africa, never sailed. The Tocharian language is written in Karasti script. This script was used to write the Gandhari and Buddhist text. According to Glass, the Karasti script appears fully developed in the Ashokan inscriptions of Shabar, Shabazz Gahi <coughs> and Mansahari. These inscriptions date back to the third century BC 
It continued to be used in Guandahara, Kushan, and Sagdian. Glass provides evidence that the Karasti writing dates back to the first Brahmi inscriptions of India. The fact the writing was used in India by Ashoka to produce the rock edicts demonstrates that Karasti was in use long before the introduction of the Merodic script to Kush. The Merodic script resembles many Karasti signs. Some researchers argue that the Merodics did not adopt the writing system of the Kushana, Tracharian people, which was Karasti. Although this is their opinion, look, 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 look at these signs. Ivan did a comparison of Merodic and Karasti signs and discovered that 34 out of 42 signs, or 81% of the signs, matched. This is why. This is why those Egyptians who were in the Grand Canyon, this is why they had that Buddha. This is why, in a sense, you saw the lotus, the lotus flowers in his hands. Yes, these were Egyptians. Since Sucharya was written in Karasti, the cognition between Karasti and Merodic is quite interesting and shows some connection between these scripts. It also offers additional support to the Tracharian origin of Merodic writing. Yes, yes, yes. The presence of Indian traders, settlers in Moreau and Egypt, makes it almost impossible to deny the possibility that, that there were people in Egypt who were familiar with Buddha, Buddhism, and then explains how these people got there. The lotus in Buddhism represents purity of mind and body. The open blossom represents full enlightenment. Other Buddhist elements in Merodic society was the footprint. Elephants and swastika that I showed you on on that on that uh, on that funeral that funeral stella of the sister seen in Merodic iconography and the influence of Karasi on Merodic script. The swastika in Buddhism means good luck. It is represented on the stella of Mateya. Yes, yes, yes. This is a stella of Mateya. Look at that swastika. Isn't any wonder that 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 these Egyptians who were in the Grand Canyon would have paid homage, homage, would have paid honor, given honor to Buddha. The black people already doing it in Africa. I'm going to tell you. We need researchers to go and go through these Egyptian records and bring out the history that is there. We need them to do what I did, find out about Stu, find out about Buddhism. But no, our people, in a sense, they talk a lot of ish. Finally, footprints are, are found in numerous Merodic sites. In Buddhism, footprints represent the presence of enlightenment and represents the pilgrimage of the followers of Buddhism to Merodic temples. Look, 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 here's a stella with the footprints on it. These are found throughout the Merodic Sudan. Kush! Look, look. In conclusion, it is obvious that Buddhism was worshipped in the Merodic Empire of Kush. This supported by one, the presence of Kushites in Africa and Asia. Two, Ashoka sent many Buddhist missionaries to Egypt who wrote their scriptures in Kairasti and Tracharya. Three, a Blima native to the Merodic Empire as mentioned in numerous Buddhist Bali texts. Four, the presence of Kushana sages in India who have, may have migrated to Moreau. Five, the, pre the presence of Buddhist colonies at Memphis, Egypt. Six, Buddhist iconography at the Naka Temple of Apodime and classical references to Buddhism in Egypt and the Merodic Empire proves that Buddhism was practiced in Egypt and Kush. The historical evidence makes it clear that the monuments in the Grand Canyon Valley, they combine Egyptian and Buddhist features came in a sense because of the fact that they were practicing Buddhism. Yes, 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 yes. This Buddhism figure on the top right hand side that Kincaid claims he saw is understandable. It explains. And it gives it gives further evidence that Egyptians were in the Nile Valley. They tell you it's a myth, but the fact that these Egyptians Practice of show Buddha in such a prominent place. Prove beyond a doubt that there were Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. You know, if you want to find out more, get my books. 
you know, African origins of Buddhism and the civilization of India. Get my book, get my book. Also, if you want to find out more about the Merodic script, get my book, Merodic Writing and Literature. And if you want to find out about more, find out more about how the Nile Valley is really represented in the ancient records of, of India, get my book, Nile Valley History and the Reg Vita. Get these books and you will find out the truth. I, you know, I've written a lot of books and, and the reason I, I had to write these books is because the fact is that it is so much of our history that's left out, left out of books. You know, I, I saw this thing, I think it's called uh, whatever uh, whatever history of some, some ish, and they're talking about dangerous Sumerians. These, these damn people, they had the nerve to make a video. They, they, they stole completely, they stole completely verbatim many of my statements on my videos and books that I've written over the past 46 years, you see? And yet these people in whatever history, do they mention my name? No, they won't mention my name. They don't mention my name. See, that just shows how, how some people are. Some people, instead, instead of giving roses to other black people, you see, they want to deny it. They, they feel this is, oh, we'll give roses to the white folks. We'll give roses to the acceptable black people that uh, the white people may, may, may have at least mentioned. You know, so many black people are always waiting for the white man to tell them something. Get the hell out of here. If you keep waiting for Europeans to tell your history, you will not know ish. I deciphered the Merodic script many years ago. These are some of my many books. You can find my books at Amazon.com. And I, I, I've written many books on the uh, Merodic language. I've deciphered many inscriptions. The Merodic Chamber of Philae, get that book. The Kushite Prince, Akinadad, Akinadad. Akinadad is very interesting because Akinadad is the prince who fought the Romans. I know you've heard the story about the one-eyed queen. Ah, that was Akinadad's mother. Get my book. If you want to find out how I decipher many of these ancient languages, get my book in a sense that deals with these, my decipherment of these ancient scripts. And then finally, in my book, Merodic Relations with Trochar and the Nile Valley Languages, I show you how my decipherment of the Merodic script is, is supported by the fact that you find many African languages that carry Merodic today. See, Merodic words. Because see, Merodic, just like ancient Egyptian, Metanetter, Metanetter were, in a sense, lingua francas. And lingua franca is, in a sense, a language that people use to unify themselves when there's a number of people speaking varied languages. Again, please go to Patreon to see the slides. These slides from this presentation are all on, on, uh, on Patreon. You can see them there. Get more information. You can join my Patreon. You can help support me. Also, look at some of the other videos on this site. This is just a live. I have over two, I have almost 300 videos and documentaries. I've been doing this. I've had videos up since 2006, 2006, 2010. I've been putting it out there because, see, I want you to know the truth. I want you to know, in a sense, what we've done. I want you to know that we are, in a sense, a people who have a great history. We have an authentic history. We have a history that, that everybody needs to know. And so that's why I'm here, you know. Thank you, Coggin Bay. Thank you, Anwar Bay. Thank you, Colin. Colin Pierre, you know, Heru Hata, Jay Indo. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for watching because see, it's you. It's you. You see? Yes, you're right, Jakari Bay. The devil lies. He, he lies and he has to lie. And the reason he has to lie is because see, if you know your history, then you'll stop all this bullish. You'll stop, you'll stop, you'll stop in a sense, you know, believing in all of these lies. But these lies can only be erased if we fight to tell the truth. These lies can only be erased if we begin to show our true history and our true history. Our true history comes from the fact in the sense that, 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 that we built civilization. We spread civilization. What did Melvin Reed say? Let's look at this. Let's look at what Melvin Reed said. He said, as I don't have mixed it in with with Hurrians and turn, turned himself white. He said to his heart, he will kill his black brother. 
over the over the verb right yes 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 people want to live a lie people want to live a lie you know I'm, I'm very happy to hear and look let's see let's look at what uh what in the stand he says i have all the books the shola kings and connections with the ethiopians and hindus of Zephyr. thank you thank you we need more people to look into this you know no i'm not doing lectures i i, I spend a lot of my time researching Right now, I have a class. Uh, I have a class in the sense of uh, Truth Seeker. And because I have a class now, Truth Seeker asks the question I'm in Chicago. Are you doing any lectures? No, I'm not doing lectures. I'm doing a lot of research. I have a class that I teach every Monday. This takes up a lot of my time. Also, this research takes up time because, see, it's only, it's only in a sense by doing research that we, that we can know our history, you see. But, uh, family, I uh, thank you for, for showing up. I'm going to have another uh, live next week and see it's very important to understand is that 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 when you're really trying when you're really trying cool dude thank you for that support you're a great guy but but when you're really trying in a sense you have to look at these tidbits and by looking at these tidbits you find out the true and and epic history of black people the true and epic history of african people you see i love you thank you for showing up I'm going to have another live uh, next month. And uh, the thing is, this is that please share this with your friends. Please share this with your family. Please check me out on a uh, professor, uh, on Dr. Uh, uh, Philippe Matthews uh, stream every Thursday. We do a, another, another, you know, investigation in our ancient history, you see. But I just wanted you to know in a sense that, that these people, they were so confident. The European was so confident. That, that the way that he could deny Egyptians were over here was by saying, in a sense, that, that Kincaid had to be wrong because they had Buddhism there. But now we see. Now we see. Now we see. What do we see? We see that Buddhism was a philosophical stance that many Egyptians had, and Kushites in Nubia. But again, thank you for, uh, for showing up. Thank you for listening to this. Share with your, share with your friends. Put a like on the video, please. Put a like right now. Take that thumb up and press that like button. And remember, knowledge is power. And our knowledge comes from doing what? From being who we are. Loving our people, loving ourselves. Save the children, our children. Thank you, DeBoer.